The Duke of Wellington is extremely important to Rusi. He was our founder in uh, 1831. He established this institute. And, of course, because of that, we've always taken a great interest in Wellington, not just in, in his achievements, but Wellington the man. The uh, Duke of Wellington <clears throat> wasn't really loved by his troops, but he was respected by them because he was a winner and uh, he didn't use, uh, squander their lives needlessly. But a lot of people don't seem to realize what the Battle of Waterloo must have taken out of him. He left his headquarters in Waterloo at about 7.30 that morning, and he rode out onto the Mont St. John Ridge, the ridge he was going to defend all day long, uh, in the hope and belief that the Prussians would arrive at some time during the day, and that combined the Prussians and Wellington's own forces would then overwhelm Napoleon's forces. He didn't get off that ridge until about 8.30 that night. That was when the last massed French attack had failed. He could see that the French were groggy. He could see then that at long last some of the Prussians were beginning to arrive uh, from the uh, east on his left flank. Uh, he didn't know then. In fact, the Prussians had been helping him by outflanking Napoleon for some hours, but he didn't know that. He couldn't see it. And so the battle was by no means won, but he realized that the French were now there for the taking. And so he ordered his forces off the ridge. He was on the right-hand side of the ridge at the time, and he went from regiment to regiment. And he sat up in his stirrups, and he waved his hat in the air, and he shouted, on, boys, on, they won't stand, they won't stand. And he got each unit moving off the ridge, and that created the momentum. The whole force came off. Of the 67,000 men that he commanded that day, he had about 30 to 35,000 maximum still in one piece, still on their feet on the ridge. And now, uh, after defending for nine hours, they moved into the attack for one hour, and the French collapsed. The, the rout was complete. When uh, his forces found that there was no other enemy in front of them and without any further orders, almost to a man, they sank down onto the ground and they fell fast asleep. Sheer nervous exhaustion. That's what soldiers do. Wellington himself, he carried on up to La Belle Alliance, which was the farm on the French side of the valley, a little bit beyond La Belle Alliance, and he there met Blucher, the Prussian commander, Blucher coming across from the uh, east, and the two commanders met up at about uh, 9.30 that evening, between 9 and 9.30. And so the two commanders were together, the two armies were united, and that was it. French defeat was overwhelming. I mean, in fact, Wellington spent very little time with Blucher, mainly because there was a complete language barrier between them, so there was almost nothing they could directly say to each other. But they shook hands across their horses. Uh, the Prussians agreed that they would take up the pursuit of the French, uh, which they did with some brutality until sometime after midnight. And that was it. Wellington's last battle was over. He was riding Copenhagen, of course, his famous horse, and now he turned Copenhagen around. And to get back to the headquarters, north of Waterloo, he had to traverse the whole battlefield, back up to La Belle Alliance, back down into the valley that they'd fought through, back up onto the ridge that he'd defended, and then beyond that, about a mile and a half into the village of Waterloo and to his headquarters. It was actually a, a very small battlefield. Um, certainly his part of it was not much more than about a mile and a half long by a mile deep. And that morning, that whole area had stood chest high in wheat and barley and rye, all waiting to be harvested. And now all the crops had long been since trampled down, and between 42 and 53,000 men and more than 10,000 horses lay dead or dying in that space. And now Wellington and Copenhagen had to pick their way down the road that traversed the whole battlefield. Away to his left, he would have seen uh, Hougoumont, the Chateau Hougoumont, defended by the guards from virtually the first shot to the very last, still burning. Ahead, the road took him right past the farm of Les Centres, the farmhouse that had stood just below the ridge in the centre of his position, the holding of which was critical to his ability to cling on to that ridge for nine hours. And then on the other side of the road, literally the other side of the road, was the famous sand pit, which had changed hands six or seven times that day in the struggle for the farm of Les Centres. And then urging Copenhagen one more time up the slope onto that bloody, bloody ridge. And then with the battlefield behind him down the long road to the inn at Waterloo that was his headquarters. And by now he was pretty well on his own. <clears throat> During the battle, he'd ridden round the, the field of battle with about an entourage of maybe 20 people, riders, his assistants, his aides, his commanders. Every single one of them now was either dead or wounded or missing. Of that whole entourage of 20 people, he was the only one, the only one, to emerge at the end of it, completely unscathed. It was absolutely astonishing. Uh, that morning, he'd breakfasted with most of those officers at the headquarters in Waterloo. And, of course, the 
Uh, the staff had prepared food for everybody now, but there was only him. Actually, he was joined then by one other person, a Spanish aristocrat, a man called Miguel Roberto de Alava. And he had been, Alava had been his liaison officer during the Peninsula campaign. Alava is the only man known to history to have fought at both Trafalgar and at Waterloo, albeit on different sides. But he and the Duke had become firm friends over the years, and now he and Alava, they sat together in that building at a big table in a big room, and they ate a meal in complete silence. The waiters came and went, and every time the door opened, the Duke would look at the door to see if it was one of his young officers, but it never was. And about midnight, he got up from the table, and he didn't go to his own bedroom. Um, Alexander Gordon, the Honourable Alexander Gordon, a man who'd been his ADC for six years, he was very fond of him, he thought very highly of Alexander Gordon, and he'd had Gordon put in his bed where he was dying of his wounds. He'd had his leg amputated, and now he was dying. And Wellington went in to see him for a little while, he spoke to him for a little while, and then he went into the front room of the house, the grand room overlooking the, the main road outside. This was his working room. Uh, in that room there was a big... Uh, wooden surround fireplace and then in front of the fireplace his campaign chair his campaign table still there today and a bed had been brought in just behind the door on the right hand side and this is where he now came to sleep <laughs> all through his life Wellington was a very punctilious man but now like his soldiers in the field filthy and stinking from the battle fully clothed he sank down onto the bed and was out cold sheer nervous exhaustion he woke about three hours later, somewhere between three and four in the morning, and the doctor came in, Dr. Hume. And the doctor, during the night, amongst other things, had been collecting the reports coming in from the battlefield about who'd ended up where, what the situation seems to be, and, of course, who, what the dead and wounded were, I mean, what the butcher's bill was for this victory. And he delivered his reports while Wellington sat on the side of the bed. And then the doctor went through a list of the, the men of note, the aristocrats, who were missing or believed dead or who were known to be dead. And it was quite a long list. Uh, Picton, William Ponsonby, Frederick Ponsonby, Delancey, Fox Canning, Chambers, Lestrange, Stothert, Alexander Gordon, who just died a few minutes ago next door, and on and on. And as he listened to this long list of names, the Duke just stared ahead of him. And then at the end he said... Thank God I do not know what it is to lose a battle, but it is a pitiable thing to win one and lose so many of one's friends. And that became the essence of a, a phrase he repeated many times. If he, if he had a good phrase, the Duke would use it repeatedly. And he was famous years later for saying, next to a battle lost, there is nothing so pitiable as a battle won. And this seems to be the first time as he, that he expressed that thought. And then he was quiet for a while. And then he suddenly put his hand out to the doctor, and the doctor took his hand. Still nothing was said. I mean, Wellington was not the sort of man you get into easy conversation with. And the doctor took a little sideways look at him, and he saw his face was almost black from the smoke and the dirt of the battle the day before. And now the doctor could see tears running down his face. And Wellington shook, and he trembled, and began to weep. And he hunched over, clutching the doctor's hand, and he cried like a baby for a while. After a few minutes, he composed himself again, and he thanked the doctor and dismissed him. And this kept happening to Wellington in the weeks and months after the battle. Everyone wanted him to talk about it, of course, and he wouldn't. He just dismissed people in that brusque way of his. But when he was made to talk about it by his family, by the royal family, by royalty, he would begin to tell his story and he would be overcome. He'd start to cry, couldn't carry on. And he said on many occasions during these weeks, I fought my last battle. It's a word, phrase he used all the time, I fought my last battle. He said it through his tears. He wrote it in a, a letter to his brother. He wrote it in a letter to one of the adoring young women he always corresponded with. I fought my last battle. And I'm convinced that that wasn't just a statement of fact. That was an absolute cry from the heart. I mean, Wellington had 20 years of political career ahead of him. But after fighting in Copenhagen, in Flanders, in India, at uh, Serengapitam and, and uh, uh, Gwaligor and Assay, and then in the peninsula, in battle after battle after battle, more than 30 of them, and then up over the Pyrenees into the siege and the capture of Toulouse, and then this final climactic battle of Waterloo. I think as a soldier, as a commander, as the man who took responsibility, I don't think he had anything left. He'd given every last drop of himself. And that image of him sitting on his bed, weeping like a baby, captures for me in one single picture all the courage and the discipline and the sheer bloody pity of it all.